Dragons being dragons embraced their role as god kings over men. After all, were they not fashioned in Akatosh's own image? Were they not superior in every way to the hordes of small, soft creatures that worshipped them? For dragons, power equals truth. They had the power, so therefore it must be truth. Dragons. Dov Ra to the Nords, Dovazul in their native tongue. Great beasts that inspire fear and fealty in most cultures on Tamriel. These winged creatures transcend time as the immortal children of Akatosh, inhabiting the world from the start of time to the very end. Eternal, immortal, unchanging, and unyielding, they are not born or hatched, they do not mate or breed. There are no known examples of dragon eggs or dragonlings. They are, always were, and always will be. What is up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Fudge Muppet, my name is Scott and today we're going to be looking at the dragons of the Elder Scrolls, giving you a complete look at their origins, their history, where they fit in the universe and the variety you'll find on your journey throughout Tamriel. There is a lot of mystery and uncertainty tied up in the world of dragons, so let's dive into the world of these scaly beasts. Dragons are said to be the children of Akatosh, the great dragon at the beginning of all, and as a result of this, they are said to be intimately attuned to the flow of time. The avatar of Akatosh himself is a flaming dragon, as seen in Oblivion. Now, while all dragons are linked to Akatosh in some way, Alduin the World Eater sits in a unique position as the self-proclaimed firstborn of Akatosh. We'll be discussing him in detail later on as he's quite an important figure for the story of dragons in Tamriel throughout the eras, but first, some essential background information. The dragons are rumored to hail from the Far East in Akavir, which literally translates to Dragon Land, yet other sources claim they came from Atmora. It is theorized that the Saesi of Akavir eventually forced the dragons to flee to Tamriel for fear of being consumed by the vampiric serpent folk, which, if true, speaks volumes about their power. But speaking of Akavir, Tosh Raka, leader of the Kapotan, the Tiger People, who also inhabit the Eastern Land, is rumored to have succeeded in turning himself into a dragon. If you swap his names around, you actually get Raka Tosh, which sounds eerily familiar to Akatosh. This could simply be a fun little homage to the lore, but it may have a deeper meaning when you consider he's the only character in recorded history to do what he did and turn into a dragon. Perhaps he transformed into an avatar of Akatosh, or mantled him in some way, but with such little information available, we can only speculate. Once settled in Tamriel, the dragons found homes in isolated mountain villages, where they could fly uninterrupted and even raise cattle. Surprisingly, dragons were even known to smith weapons and artifacts, with the Golden Katana Goldbrand said to be created by the dragons of the north for a great knight sworn to protect their kind. As the dragons were highly skilled in magic while also exhibiting incredible intelligence and capacity for emotion, the fact that they have lived like any other people of Tamriel becomes easier to believe. As social creatures, complete isolation isn't their preferred way of living, being known to drive one mad if isolated for too long. Such an example is the dragon Numenex, who was said to have been driven half mad even forgetting his own name after years of captivity. The power one associates with dragons, specifically the fire breath and flight, is actually part of the unique magic that dragons are attuned to. Due to their size and aerodynamics, these creatures wouldn't even be able to fly without the aid of this magic. Their language, Dovazul or dragon tongue, is used to both communicate and to battle. This is also known as the Thum, the powerful magic cast by these ancient creatures with the utterance of a few words. While mortal man and Mur are able to learn the Thum since they were taught by Parthenax, those who are gifted with the soul of a dragon are able to learn these shouts much faster. Due to their language being so closely tied to their magic, battles between dragons are more accurately described as heated debates than actual fights, hurling loud shouts at one another with deadly force. While you may experience the dragons haphazardly unleashing the voice on innocent villagers, it is said that in the early years of Tamriel, this power was only wielded by dragons in times of true need. There are many stories and myths surrounding the nature of dragons. In the Iliac Bay, dragon eggs have been claimed to exist, but have since been proven false. In fact, unlike many dragons in other fictional worlds, there are no dragon eggs in the world of the Elder Scrolls, nor any dragon younglings. Instead of being born, dragons simply are. Age 
ageless and immortal, their souls transcend physical death, making them much more like the Aedra than creatures of Mundus. Long and slender, these grand beasts have two wide wings, rear legs equipped with sharp talons and ridges of spikes down their backs, and of course, their mighty jaws, a physicality that is perfect for dominating all other creatures, which is actually perfect because by nature, dragons have a strong desire to dominate alongside a lust for power. It is a lust so strong that it even turned Alduin from his duty as World Eater, but despite this, some dragons like Parthenax have managed to overcome this insatiable lust in order to live peacefully, utilizing meditation. This coupled with the protection of the Greybeards is what allowed Parthenax to survive where others were hunted and destroyed. But if the dragons were so powerful, why do they still not rule today? How did these creatures go from fearsome rulers to legends spoken of in hushed tongues before the reappearance of Alduin in Skyrim? In the Marethic era, there existed the Dragon Empire with Bromanjar, the ancient capital city of Skyrim that surrounded the Labyrinthian, a temple to the dragons constructed by the Dragon Cult. It was the major seat of power in Skyrim. Beyond their desire to dominate, dragons never really seemed to care for the actual duties of governance that came with such power. The solution to this was the dragon cult, headed by the dragon priests to act as kings for the populace at the dragon's behest. These dragon priests kept the populace obedient with their zealous cultists and with the dragons backing them. The uneasy peace that was kept by the dragon priests between man and dragon resulted in many worshippers becoming the undead draga that call the crypts of Skyrim, Solstheim and Akmora home to this day. For their service, the dragon priests were gifted great power, knowledge and the dragon masks while ruling over the men of Skyrim. The dragon priests believed that upon their death, should they be entombed with their followers, Alduin would one day return and resurrect them alongside any fallen dragons. The followers buried with the priests would conduct daily rituals, rising to gather around the priest and pass their life force onto them in order to sustain them for the coming resurrection. This ritual continuing over thousands of years is what turned the followers into the aforementioned Draga. In the fourth era, the dragon priests in the world exist in a powerful Draga-like form, poised to defend their treasures. Naturally, the dragons were greatly feared by the populace and their cruelty eventually resulted in rebellion. Nordic legend tells of Alduin forsaking his duties as a world eater to lead his kin to terrorize and oppress the people of Mundus, slaughtering and destroying whatever they saw fit. The tension culminated in the terrifyingly destructive clash between dragon and man that would become known as one of the most violent wars of Skyrim's history, aptly named the Dragon War. Despite their perception as godlike, the people soon realized that dragons could be killed. Not all dragons sided with Alduin in this war either, with some fighting against their own kind, and others still arming the Nords with powers to fight back. Parthenax, originally the lieutenant of his older brother Alduin, eventually chose to rebel against Alduin and taught the Nords the way of the Thum. Before his turn, he committed heinous atrocities against the people of Tamriel, so whether this betrayal was coaxed by Kine, the Nordic goddess of storms as believed by the Nords, or perhaps it was the bold claims of the divine from Alduin himself alienating Parthenax and the other dragons, we just simply do not know and it is up for debate. This betrayal ultimately spelt the end for the Dragon War. With the power of the Thorm and Elder Scroll, three Nordic heroes created the shout Dragonrend to subdue Alduin, sending him forward in time with the Elder Scroll. These heroes, Feldir the Old, Hakon One-Eye, and Goliath Goldenhilt, all appear in Skyrim, aiding the Dragonborn in stopping Alduin from completing his destiny as the World Eater. But you know that all too well. Before leaving the Morethic era entirely, we need to touch on Kalgrontid and his horde of dragons in elsewhere. While the dragons ruled from their seat of power in Skyrim, this small horde came to power over elsewhere. Their goal was to consume the moon's lunar power, with Kalgrontid hoping it would make him the equal of Alkosh, the dragon king of cats, which is to say, the equal of Akatosh. Their lust for the power of Jode, the moon god's core, led them to be tricked by a force led by Khajiit hero Kunzari, consisting of Nurarian the Perfect, Flintfield Demon Hunter, Anaquina Sharptongue, and Sir Cadwell. These companions found fighting to be useless, instead opting to aid the dragons in their ambitious quest, in truth weakening them after they passed their energy into Jode's core. 
Kunzari lured the dragons to the halls of the Colossus, sealing them away. In order to obscure their existence, Kunzari called them a demon weapon, inscribing the location of their resting place on the fabled Wrathstone. As their existence became legend, the dragons were known as demons by the local populations. The Wrathstone resurfaced in the Second Era, year 582, and the dragons were released by Abner Tharn, tricked by his half-sister Euraxia Tharn. She sought out the legendary demon weapon as part of her oppressive rule in Rimen. When Kalgrontid and his horde was released, Euraxia allied with them, seeing them as a weapon to be used. Instead, the dragons crossed her in their renewed quest for lunar power. The unfolding saga led to Euraxia's death, the return of Rimen to Khajiit rule, and the death of Kalgrontid and his kin. Once again, he was defeated in the Plain of Jode, ending the power-hungry dragon's presence in the region. With Alduin lost to time, the remaining dragons were either hunted or went into hiding. Over the millennia, their numbers dwindled significantly. Supposedly, the cliff races pushed dragons out of Morrowind, and some of their last numbers were tracked down and killed by the Dragon Guard, the famed Akaviri warriors who swore fealty to Remen after their defeat. This is the very same order that would later evolve into the Emperor's personal special force, the Blades. Tiber Septum historically offered those remaining dragons protection in return for their service before his ascension. Nephalalagus was one such example, a great red dragon who was instrumental in Tiber Septum's conquering of Hammerfell. But regardless of Imperial protection, it didn't keep many more alive for long. This time is when dragons slipped away from common memory, with only reports of great worms in the desert wastes of the Alakir Desert. Few races and groups in Tamriel still saw the dragons as sacred creatures, allying with them in secret to help protect any that remained through the Third and Fourth Eras. Then the World Eater reappeared returning to Tamriel after being cast forward in time. With his return came the resurgence of dragons throughout parts of Morrowind and Skyrim, resurrected or bolstered by the return of Akatosh's firstborn, Alduin. The so-called last dragonborn also appeared during this time, rising to oppose the resurrected dragon force attacking Skyrim. With the help of the Greybeards and Parthenax who survived the errors by becoming the leader of the Greybeards at the throat of the world, the dragonborn was able to fell many of the dragons serving under Alduin. Alduin, however, proved impervious to death in Mundus, but by venturing into Sovngarde and with the assistance of the three original heroes who banished him the first time, Alduin was slain. While defeated, Alduin's soul was never absorbed by the Dragonborn, as dragons are not killed unless their soul is consumed, perhaps Alduin remains alive, biding his time to one day fulfill his destiny as the World Eater. Despite being the firstborn of Akatosh, Alduin also saw himself as a god. The relationship he held with the Dragon God emboldened and empowered him throughout time, but his role in the Nordic Pantheon cannot be overlooked. World Eater is not just a title, he really is believed to have a pivotal role in the destruction of Nern and the ending of the Kalpic Cycle, so it can begin anew. Whether he is an aspect of Akatosh himself, split from the god, or actually just the Nordic version of Akatosh is up for debate within the universe, though Alduin referring to himself as the firstborn of Akatosh would likely contradict this last theory. However, his connection to the divine cannot be denied. From Akatosh primarily, with the exception of Mirak and perhaps others, also come the Dragonborn, mortals born with the blood and soul of a dragon flowing through them. Dovazul in the dragon tongue meaning both dragonborn and dragon hunter born, hinting at the duality of those bestowed with this heritage. Those born of the dragon are rare in Tamriel, as the dragon blood is a gift from Akatosh himself to those he favors. It is unlikely that more than one of these exist at the same time, but they can be any mortal, no matter the race or gender. The gift of the Dragonborn is treated in high regard, especially for the rulers of Cyrodiil. Saint Alicia was blessed by Akatosh and given the Amulet of Kings to cement the tradition going forward of legitimate rulers being known as Dragonborn and wearing the Amulet. Remen Cyrodiil, Tiber Septum, Martin and Uriel Septum all followed Alicia as known Dragonborn. Despite physically being susceptible to all mortal vulnerabilities like old age or disease, the Dragonborn have the ability to consume the souls of fallen dragons. However, for most of time since the First Era, dragons have been rare, so it remained an ability unrealized. They're also attuned to the Thumb, able to learn words instantly through the absorption of dragon souls instead of the years of practice required for others. This profound ability 
duality makes them the ultimate dragon killer. This is where the duality I mentioned earlier comes into play, both attuned to the dragons and their apex predator. It's interesting that Akatosh would offer favored mortals the power to so efficiently destroy his own children. Perhaps this is Akatosh's way of writing things in the world. Where Alduin shirked his responsibility to eat the world by attempting to rule it, the Dragonborn was risen to punish him for it, but unable to consume the soul should he be ready to restart time once more. You know very well as the last Dragonborn in Skyrim that you end up as a very efficient dragon killer with many shouts at your disposal. The hit list of dragon kills is so long and varied throughout your playthroughs, but not every dragon is the same. Some ancient and fearsome, others fall quickly to your experienced blade. Common dragons are brown in colour and the weakest of those you'll find in Tamriel, but also the most widely seen. These creatures exhibit the standard characteristics of the species, with a few defining features aside from the basic thumb control. Blood dragons are very similar to the common dragons, green in colour despite the name. They're slightly larger and more powerful with a small sail on their back, a flat leaf shaped tail and a frill around the top of their skull. Unique to blood dragons, their eyes have pupils that run horizontally rather than vertically, though the reason for this is unknown. Frost dragons are white with blue, black and grey markings all over their body. They feature large fearsome looking spines down their back, generally a tiny bit bigger than the blood dragons. Instead of fire breath, they prefer to use their frost breath, as their name would suggest. Elder dragons are where the creatures start to level up drastically in power and intimidation. Much larger than the previous three, these dragons are bronze coloured with bony bumps down their spine and a more fearsome face, complete with large curved horns. Capable of both fire and frost breath, taking on these beasts without strong weapons and armor is inadvisable, even for a dragonborn. Ancient dragons are the most powerful creatures you'll find in the main parts of Skyrim, more tan and pink than their elder counterparts. With the same intimidating face and horns, their back spines are more pronounced. Serpentine dragons, despite sharing the basic abilities and form of an elder dragon, their neck and heads resemble a great snake, long and smooth. Their scales are much finer than a regular dragon's and they have a unique face, complete with a sharp-toothed underbite. Happening upon a revered dragon is much rarer, but these creatures are stronger than even the ancient dragons. Orange, with a long blue stripe running up the length of their spine, these dragons have beaked faces, making them unique amongst their species, as well as their large lidless eyes. Two notable revered dragons are Narsularum and Voslarum able to drain the vitality of their foes alongside their fiery breath. At Arquind Point, you'll find the strongest of all dragons, save for Alduin and Parthenax, the legendary dragon. Their fearsome skulls are crested with unique curved horns, and their hide is colored black and purple. Instead of standard eyes, these dragons have multiple eyes in the same socket, similar to that of a bug. While Arquind is a guaranteed location, it is possible that many legendary dragons can attack you in your travels. A few notable dragons do exist outside of these classifications though. Alduin is unique in his appearance as a black dragon covered in twisted barbs and spikes. His wings also have a large talon midway up the limb, making him deadly through both his shouts and claws. Parthenax also has a different look, showing signs of age and wear despite resembling a common dragon for the most part. But you absolutely should not be killing Parthenax. Dunavir is an undead dragon, most closely resembling a frost dragon in appearance, but markedly different due to his four horns and large spiked back. His wings and flesh look greatly decayed, grey-green and constantly oozing. Doomed to guard the soul can, this undead dragon is unlike any other due to this unique predicament. The only other undead dragon are skeletal dragons raised by necromancy. These beasts do not contain a dragon soul and are comprised of bones only, like a living museum display. Elsewhere's leading trio of dragons also exhibit unique appearances. Kalgrontid is green with four horns on his head and more spikes along his body. Mulamnir is blue, smaller with horns and spikes and a morning star-like tail. Balokdan is the least impressive of the trio, dark green and without any fearsome horns. While we don't have an official category these dragons fit into, it is likely they could be considered unique dragons regardless due to their impact on elsewhere's history. Despite sharing a resemblance to dragons, the dragonlings of the Iliac Bay are simply large lizards, unrelated to Akatosh. In twisted imitation, the Daedric Titans of Molag Bal are dark creations made to mimic the dragons of Tamriel, yet they do not match their true power. 
A dragon's power cannot be merely mimicked. Their power is so grand that they've been able to imbue relics with amazing effects. The most notable relics of the dragons are the dragon priest masks, gifted to the priests of the dragon cult. While the exact numbers of masks created is unknown, 19 feature in Skyrim, made from varying materials like ebony, bronze, and wood. They carry the name and stories of the priest who wore it. They bless the wearer with increased magical powers, and collecting them means fighting the undead priests themselves, but the reward is often worth the cost. Now, while not made by the dragons, but made from them, the dragon bone and scale armor and weapons could be considered relics of a kind. These items are crafted from materials harvested from fallen dragons and offer heavy and medium protection or powerful weapons to use in the hunting of other dragons. If you want to delve deeper into the creation and history of dragon bone armor and weapons themselves, we have a video dedicated to the topic linked below. And that is all, ladies and gentlemen, the complete guide to dragons, the fearsome children of Akatosh that have ruled over mankind, inspiring both fear and admiration. It is no wonder that the Imperial Empires of Cyrodiil throughout history have chosen the sigil of an eternal, powerful, and awe-inspiring creature, traits that they would want associated with their own glory. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and before I leave you, I want to ask you a question. If you were transported to Skyrim in the Morethic Era, would you want to join the Cult of Dragons, potentially becoming a Dragon Priest, or would you fight against the odds, joining the ranks of mortals against the Eternal Tyrants? Thanks again so much for watching, guys. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll nerd out with you again in the next one.